welcome you to the last chapter of the revised book on the fivefold. By the grace of the Lord, we have added two chapters in the course of this edition. And I want to thank the Lord for you that you are part of it all that we've been studying. And remember, the fivefold is one of the things that organized religion took away from the body of Yeshua when it emerged as a marriage of church and state in the fourth century. And so if you're going to talk about reformation of the church, you're going to go beyond what Martin Luther did in 1517. You're going to go beyond that, beyond his reformation, because the reformation focused on essentially rediscovering the truth that the just shall live by faith. He didn't go further. And so whatever he did was good. It was intro into the kingdom. The just shall live by faith. Without faith, no salvation. A salvation by grace through faith. The Lord used him to recover that truth. And that journey, which is now 503 years ago, the Lord is saying to the church, go beyond recovery of that primal truth to the other truths. And there are many other truths that were chucked out when Rome kicked out Yeshua, married his church in the 4th century. Remember between the years AD 311 when the Edict of Milan was signed to the year 381 when the church and the state finally became one. Certain things were done to the church to remove the organic nature of the church, the organic leadership of the church, the kingdom focus of the church to create an entity, a religious entity that was suited to the interest of the Roman Empire. And he did it so well that even though the Roman Empire fell in AD 476, even though the Roman Empire fell, that is the western part, the eastern part lasted for almost a thousand years again, out of Constantinople, which is modern day uh, Istanbul in Turkey. The reality is that the church that came out of that union outlasted the empire and still has power and clout till today. Religion is strong, it's powerful. And so if you're going to be a reformer, the Lord wants us to go all the way past Rome to Jerusalem. What did Yeshua teach? What did he preach? And the Bible tells us in Matthew 24, 14, Yeshua gave a mandate to his church. He said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then the end will come. So the Lord wants us to recapture the gospel of the kingdom, not churchianity not religion. The gospel of the kingdom, about the king and his kingdom, about the reality that the king is supreme. You can only be in his kingdom if you submit to his sovereign rule, and submitting to his sovereign rule is evidence in taking his word to be true. And in this regard, in this course, the fivefold, we have been looking at what the master builder he appointed for his church, Paul, the apostle, what he gave him to give to the church, which is that he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, and that their work is to perfect the saints so that the saints who are perfected will do the work of ministry and the body is edified. That is what we studied in this course. And that is what we're concluding today. And by the grace of the Lord, we're going to look at something that's of interest, not just to the five people, but all kinds of leadership. Whether you're a bishop, whether you're a deacon, whether you're an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, whether you're a minister, if you are leading in the household of faith, you are in any formal role, there are certain things that ought to guide your conduct, and those things are documented, and we're going to look at them today. In a moment, Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this cause you have used to bring us to the place where, Lord, light has come. None of us can deny your light. We therefore pray for guidance by your spirit that we will take this truth and run with it in different sectors and different spheres. Thank you for answering our prayer. Holy Spirit, guard our hearts and minds. Let, let the seed of the world fall on fertile ground and let nothing take it away. Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen. So I just want to share with you 
general biblical qualifications for leadership in the household of faith. This is extracted from the ordination manual. We have an ordination manual that, you know, whatever stream you came into, whether you came into International Ministers Fellowship as a minister, whether you train in Global School of Ministry and finish your training or train in the master class or train through the YES course, there comes a day you are released to serve, you are released to go and practice what you learned, which is ordination or commissioning, as the case may be. There's a manual guiding it, so the Lord led us to extract some materials from that manual with which to close out this study on the fivefold general biblical qualifications for leadership in a household of faith. And so we need to take a few notes of some things. The qualifications for those who lead is well documented. It's not something the Lord wanted to leave to guesswork or subjective, you know, principles, I mean, subjective opinion, whatever you like. No. Before the law, before Moses, you know, began to walk, in the fullness of his assignment, you know what? The principles were articulated for him by Jethro, his father-in-law. And his father-in-law, in the book of, you know, um, Exodus 18, his father-in-law told him some things that were profound. He told him, Moses, what are you doing? Morning till night, only you, only you. The whole of Israel that came out, 600,000 men, then we two, if you have children, women, all that, only you from morning till night, judging them, he said, no. The man didn't want his daughter to become a widow prematurely. Is it not true today that many ministers are getting too old, too early, too old, too early? A part of it has to do with the stress of work, overwork. And that's what the religious system does because he says it has hired you and pays your salary as a professional, religious professional. He expects you to just do all the work alone. And brothers and sisters, what we have read in the five foot says that it is not so. Each of us should take a little chunk of the work and we bring it together. No ambition. All we are seeking is the king's glory and we serve the people. But even though you are called to be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, what are the qualifications and what are the ethical guidelines that should guide us? Jethro gave us some of them. Number one, he told Moses, if you read Exodus chapter 18, verse 21 to 22, these things I'm going to mention are there. Let me say, provide out of all the people. Provide out of the people. Leadership must come from those who have drank from the same spiritual drink and eating from the same spiritual meal. It is important that when leadership is going to be made, don't go and import people because of a reputation or what you know on social media. No, leadership must come from within, provide out of the people. And I tell you the honest truth, I made mistakes in time past, and I want to tell you this, once you miss this, you are so in trouble for yourself. Leadership must be, and when a replacement was sought for Judas Iscariot in Acts chapter 1, 21 to 22, this was also declared. Peter told them, you know what, it's time to get out of the people who have been with Yeshua from the baptism of John to the day he was taken up. There should be one. In other words, out the people. It is important because whoever it is that will lead, it's better to come out of the DNA of the house, what revelation the Lord has given to the house, so that the person can fit in. So important. Number two, he told him in that same Exodus 18, 21 to 22, able men. Who is an able person? Now listen, the language of the Bible is masculine. That doesn't mean it's only men. Able men means able humans. An able person is one who does not give room for failure. An able one is one who does not give excuse for not doing the work. An able one is one who will get things done in spite of challenges. So he said, provide out of the people, able men. Number three, he said, such as fear Elohim. Every minister, to be able to be a minister or a leader, should be a person who fears Elohim. Fear of Elohim should be critical. 
because it's going to help somebody to know Elohim, that Elohim sees the heart, sees the mind, sees the will, sees the intention and the motivation behind what is said or what is done. And there's no hiding place to Elohim. If one doesn't fear Elohim, that person is more dangerous than a nuclear bomb. Anyone who is in ministry, is in leadership, and has no fear of Elohim, that person is either backsliding or apostate, and is a dangerous situation. Elohim knows the heart of all, and it is important that whoever will serve him should be one that has that basic understanding that Elohim knows all, sees all, so there is no hiding place from him. Then number four, he told him, he told Moses also, men of truth, ministers must be people who are truthful. Because the tongue is the instrument of ministry. That's what he used to preach or teach. That's what he used to, you know, share a word of encouragement. So it should be one that doesn't bring forth uh, sweet water and bitter water, you know, true water and false water. It should be one that is truthful, even at the expense of being misunderstood, even at the expense of being, you know, disciplined or losing privilege. Say the truth. Stand on the truth. In the open, in the secret. Don't say something in the secret and say another thing in the public. Don't say another thing in your heart and say another thing on Facebook or social media. Men of truth are people who, for whom truth is a constant. The number five, he said to him also, people who hate covetousness. Brothers and sisters, covetousness is undue desire to get money, to get material things with which you can live the good life. It's covetousness. The Bible calls covetousness idolatry in the book of Colossians. Covetousness is idolatry because once your heart is latching what you want to get, it can drive you to do things that are not right and convenient and you will know it. That's why Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 that the love of money, not money, the love of it, the desire for it, is the root of all evil. Then he told him another thing, number 16, in that Exodus chapter 18, 21 to 22, he said, place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So Moses' father in law said, hey, the people you are going to find from among the people, able men who fear Elohim, who hate covetousness, they have capacity. There are those who ask their capacity is just to be able to take care of 10 people. Another person 50, another person 100, another person thousands. Look for their capacity and give them assignments. And this is very important in the household of faith of all generations. Don't go beyond your capacity. Let's say you work, you have a marketplace job. The job takes all of you and you come back drained. In that stage, if you want to go and look to be, say, a pastor, and you didn't have time to pray, don't have to, to study the word of the Lord, you are going to make a mess of that pastor because out of your mind, you are going to be telling people things, not derived from him. You may claim otherwise. So that is why, actually, the fivefold is Elohim's masterstroke for his church. Because when everybody takes a little chunk, you are not overdrained. Are you able to do what you can do? Everybody has capacity. There are those who have capacity to lead 50, uh, 20 people. Others are for 15. Others are for 10. Others are for 5. And yet, if they are pastors, give them assignments. There are others who have capacity for doing things well with their right heart. Check out their capacity and place them according to their capacity. Not by their ambition, not by what they say, but what the Lord shows you about their capacity. Now, let's go to the New Testament. A lot of people think that, oh, the New Testament is a happy-go-lucky place. Oh, it's grace, it's grace. And for them, they think that grace is licensed to live anyhow, to do things anyhow. There are no rules, there are no regulations. Whoever believes that lie is already out of the kingdom. Because the kingdom is based on recognizing the kingship of Yeshua. And if he's king, then our first order of kingdom business is to submit to his sovereign rule. And to submit to his sovereign rule is to acknowledge that the word of the king in each is power. And whatever he says for us to do is what we do. And he told us, if you love me, keep my commandments. The Lord has commandments. The Lord gave commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. He gave in the parables. He gave in the proverbs. He gave in his teachings. He gave instructions all through. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is filled with his commandments. Then the epistles 
are filled with commandments of those he spoke to and began to break down what he told them in ordinary language. And so, in the New Testament, we are told a number of things specific. You know, when Paul the Apostle was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he told him, if somebody wants to be a bishop, he desires a good work. Then he said, hey, these are qualifications to be made a bishop. And let me tell you something. It's not just bishops. It's everyone who is going to exercise authority over people. Those things are not to be switched on and off. It should be like a gold standard people should know. What did he tell him? Number one, in First Timothy 3, 1 to 7, blameless. In other words, Paul was telling Timothy, anyone wants to be a leader over people, say a pastor over a congregation, overseer over a congregation, everyone who's going to exercise authority must make sure your heart, your mind, your will is locked into the Father and His will. And there should be no room for doubt about your character. It shouldn't be one that you switch on and off, whether before believers or unbelievers, People should be able to know you and there's no blame that can attack you. People can, you know, make false imputations or allegations or false things, but anyone who has known you should be able to know what you stand for. It should be clear as crystal. Integrity. Number two, it says the husband of one wife. Now, that doesn't mean only men, okay? Like I told you, this language of the Bible. The point there is faithful to whosoever you are lawfully married to, faithful. There's no question about that. There's no Hagar somewhere, if you're a man. There's no somebody somewhere whose heart you have, who has your heart. It is you are faithful. You are locked in. Till death do you part. Till death do you part in any situation, whatever the situation is, the faithfulness is that your heart has no room for another person. No supposition inside of you. No lusting inside of you. But in reality and truth, you are one who has one spouse. That is for those who are married. And if you are not married, you are chased unto the Lord. Married to Yeshua. Then three, he says, vigilant. This is the grace to be watchful over yourself and over the flock. We are told in the book of Proverbs 27 to 23, be diligent to know the state of your flock. Look well to your hearts. If you're a leader, look well. Look well. If you're in church, you can see people making some unholy movements, unholy moves, unholy speech. Look well. Pull them aside. Reprove them. Look well. Be vigilant. Be vigilant about your own life, your mindset, your heart. How are things going on with you? Be vigilant. Then number four, sober. Whoever is going to be a leader of people should be sober. So there will be a lot of things you are going to meet. You are going to meet situations that challenge you. You are going to meet all kinds of things. You make, make sure that you are not ruled by your emotion or supposition. Be sober. When you are sober, you can get to the root of issues. When you are sober, you can be able to assess things. And for that reason, it's so important that we know that the Lord doesn't want those in leadership to be influenced by alcohol. As a matter of fact, we are told in Ephesians 5, that be drunk, not with wine, where it is excess, but be drunk in the Holy Spirit. Let it be what intoxicates us. But because it is so sad if any minister will need an intoxicant, cocaine, hemp, alcohol, you know, that to, you know, go and perform. We're not in a theater. We're in the kingdom of Elohim. And the spirit of Elohim wants to possess us wholly. Then number four, uh, number five, it says, of good behavior. Whoever we are a leader of people should have a good behavior. A minister must be well behaved. This idea of people have bad attitude. They are very negative. They are very difficult. They, 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 you, you, are, you, are, you are with them and you, you can't see anything they defying. The point to the king is not so in the New Testament. Then he says, number six, giving to hospitality. And again, I say, this is not just for bishops. If you're a leader of any sort, you must be given to hospitality. Keep an open home. Yes, I know your, your carpet was imported from Persia itself, Russia, you know, Iran. You imported your Persia rug from Iran at great cost. But if you people cannot come to your home because of that rock, you've missed it. You are not their leader. 
If you are living in a high mountains and need a helicopter to go there so that nobody can come, you are not their leader. You may be a, 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 a performer who comes to the stage, you take the helicopter from that high hill, you fly to the back of the stage and go there and you are insured for, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 million and nobody can come close to you, your bodyguards will elbow them away. You are not their leader. Giving to hospital means keep an open home. Let people be able to come and say, Pastor, I'm hungry. You sit down on the table you know, and eat. They should be able to come and you eat with them. Make them feel, feel good. Don't try to have heirs. Our king didn't have heirs. He stayed with those twelve who were with him. He stayed with them day and night. He stayed with them every time, brothers and sisters. Then he said, number seven, act to teach. Feeding the sheep with sincere milk of the word is the role of leaders. So you got to be apt to teach. Even if you are not a teacher, by calling, be apt to teach. If you know the word that is inside of you, you should be able to bring it forth to feed the people at any given time. They ask you a question, don't give your opinion. Don't give opinion from your emotion. Give the word of Elohim. That's why you got to study the word in season and out of season. Then it says again, not giving to wine. Verse number eight, not giving to wine is what we said before about being sober. Don't let any intoxicant of any sort, whatever the name is called, to enter into you. Because if you do so, you are denying Holy Spirit space. Because when you are intoxicated by anything and it moves you, the demon behind that substance is ruling you. And Holy Spirit wants to rule us 100% of the time. This is so important. Number nine, no striker. Ministers of the gospel should be above the fray. There shouldn't be people who are pugilistic. There shouldn't be people who are given to, you know, they are hitting or whatever. People who are ministers of the gospel, they should not be people who strike or strike back. Number 10, not, not greedy or filthy looker. This is also what was said in Exodus 18. Those who are ministers should not be of a covetous heart, wanting money. If money, love of money, rules and latches onto the heart of any minister, it's going to make it impossible for you to be able to give a word truly. You, that thing you are looking for from people will color the messages you give because you are looking for their pocket. You want to make them happy. And even if the Lord is saying something contrary, you will not say it. Then he says again, number nine, number 11, Patient. Whoever is going to be a leader should be patient. Be patient. There are many things that will come your way. You know what? Judge nothing before the time. Be patient. If you need an information, be patient. You'll get it. Be patient also as people begin to play up and out of as much as lies in you. Be patient and pray and see whether the Lord can sort things out. Then number 12, not a brawler. This is like the one he said before, not a striker. A brother is one who can get into a fight, get into quarrel, get into, you know, all those kind of things. We call it Bole Kaja life. Lagos, Nigeria. Bole Kaja means come down, let's fight. You know, we call, there are people who are Bole Kaja ministers. They're ready to brawl. They're ready to rumble in the jungle. No, that's not right at all. Number 13, he says, one that ruled well his house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now, those who are going to be ministers, the Lord has given you children, especially if you are still in the Lord and you were, you were in the Lord when you began to bear children. You know what? You need to make sure you model behavior and show them the way to go, encourage them to study the Bible, encourage them to pray, all these things. Because if you do that and train them up when they grow up, they'll be able to abide. You know, you can imagine how, you know, last week, favor her daughter who is in the U.S. and will finish her assignment next month and come back. She was talking to those who are intending to go to university. And favor said something that was very profound that she had heard that people say that once children of ministers go to university, they mess up, they become moral wrecks, just doing all kinds of things, partying and living all kinds of life. life. And she said to herself, not me. I will not deny my father. I will not dishonor my parents. That's more or less what she was saying. And she made up her mind and favor three, you know, three years in the university and the time in the United States of America, one year, 
you know, next month and favor has kept to that consecration by the grace of the Father. He left, also told people when he was talking to young people about the same thing. The decision inside, the decision to be, you know, chaste to the Lord, the decision to be faithful to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, and these are things, it doesn't, you don't hit it on people. If you show them and you teach them and you instruct them, they're going to catch it. Now, somebody may say, well, my children are grown. What can I do? Does that mean I'm disqualified? No. If you did your best and the children have grown and they are not within this scope of behavior and conduct, that doesn't mean you have failed. They have got to the age of reason. They've excised their reason. They've excised their will wrongly. Just intercede for them. Never stop interceding for them. And there's something I want to say, brothers and sisters. This is very important. Don't take to social media to affirm a son or daughter who is out of the way. That is worldly wisdom. It's not kingdom. So a son or daughter exposing all of herself and cleavages everything. Then you take the picture, you retweet it, you do this, my beloved son, my beloved daughter. What are you doing? You are not helping that person. There are other ways you can do it. Pray for your child. So are you affirming somebody in error? No. Brothers and sisters, rule where your house, have the children under submission, and it is so important. Then he says, number 14, not a novice. Brothers and sisters, young people in the faith need to go through process. Let's avoid the temptation and put, you know, great things on them, beyond them. You can give them assignments that will help them to grow. It's part of their growth process. There are a lot of people we are training right now. They are ministers in Arise. We're giving them assignments, watching how they do it, watching how they do it. This one will be moderator of this Sunday, and then this one will assist. Next Sunday, another person. This one will minister the word. This one will do exhortation. We do these things to check out the people and what is in them. And then they say, again, number... Uh, 15, must have a good report with them that are without. If you're a minister, it's not just those who you minister to. You live in a community. You live in a neighborhood. Those in the neighborhood, those in the community should be able to attest that this one is a minister of the gospel. These qualities should not scare you. The grace of Elohim is available to work it out in us as long as we submit to that process. If you watch T Titus chapter 1, Paul told Titus, some things, some of them are the same. He told Timothy, some are extra. We just read them out. He said, those who are going to be leading in the household of faith, they should be blameless. Number two, they should be husband or one wife. I'm talking about Titus chapter 1, verse 5 to 9. Number three, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Number four, not self-willed. Self-will is a dangerous thing. It can lead somebody off the cliff. Five, not soon angry. Those in authority must know that anger can destroy. And when it's uncontrollable, it becomes rage. So even though things may happen that won't make you angry, tell your soul, oh my soul, be quiet within me. Because anger doesn't have any much positive value apart from to deal with negative things and the, the enemy. Then it says here, number six, not giving to wine. We've talked about it. Number seven, no, no striker. We talked about it. Number eight, not giving to feel to look at. We've spoken about it. And then number nine, a lover of hospitality. We've spoken about it. Number ten, a lover of good men. If you are a minister, you've got to have a special place in your heart of people who are good, people who are on the right path so you can encourage them. Then it says, Number 11, sober. We've talked about it. Number 12, just. Just. Before Elohim, before man, before government, before everything, you are just. No reproach. And then he said, talks about holy. Eight. We are, those who are leaders should be holy people. Holiness has two connotations. Separation from everything that can defile or is negative, sin, or what glorifies Satan? Separation from them. The second part is consecration to Elohim. So, those who are going to lead must be holy, separate from evil, consecrated to Elohim. Then, number 14, it says temperate. They should be temperate. People who are balanced. People who are balanced in what to eat, what to drink. They are moderate. They have moderation. You know, the, the fact that 
They want to eat meat doesn't mean they have to eat meat, bowl of meat or bowl of fish. No, temperate in what they eat and drink. Then number five, uh, 15, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. If you're a leader, hold fast the faithful word you've been taught. And then, you know, this is so important. 15 also. And I want you to read the full text today. And uh, please remember yesterday evening we did lesson 35. Please don't skip anyone so that you can get it all. And then Paul ends this list to Titus by saying in Titus chapter 1, 10 to 11, why he gave those regulations. For there are many unruly and vain talkers, talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. You know, there are people who are too spiritual. They say, oh, just mind your own congregation, mind your own business. Don't bother about what the people are teaching or saying on social media. Huh? That's not scripture. Jude says, contend for the faith. Teach your people the truth. Teach them also errors going around so that when they see those telltale, they'll be able to relate to what they've been taught. That will save them. Don't be a false shepherd. A false shepherd doesn't care whether people are wrong or doing whatever. A false shepherd will go and share a wrong thing somebody said because he's popular. A popular one said something. It's unbiblical. You just share it. No. Teach people. So that they will know the difference between truth and error. Why did the Lord set these benchmarks for leadership? Number one, leaders derive their core validity from the degree to which they allow the world, the Lord, to work out his holy nature in and through them. So, if someone is going to be a leader, he has to be a leader because there's something the Lord has done in him to which he can say to anybody, follow me as I follow King Yeshua. If somebody cannot say that, that person is not qualified to lead people, lest he lead them off the click. Number two, all through the scriptures, the Lord places premium on character of those he calls to lead his people. All through, places character premium. Number three, by actively manifesting Christ, leaders are able to be his witnesses. In Acts 1.8, he didn't say, go and be my a broadcaster. He said, go and be my witnesses. From Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to Atmos. Who is a witness? A witness is a preacher whose life and lifestyle validates what he says. It's confirmed by what you do. You don't say to people, don't do this and then you, you do that thing. Or do this and you do contrary. No. Then the question will be, what do we owe leadership? We owe leadership a number of things. Number one, discern and recognize them. Number two, accept them in good faith. Number three, understand the level of grace the leader carries that will enable you to know how much space you need to give. Number four, four, obey instructions and submit to the authority. Number five, take a place beside them. Every leader, there's something the Lord commits to their trust. And if the Lord has brought you besides a leader, especially primary leaders, visionaries, people who are, you know, in a position where other ministers are working with them, you need to take your place beside them. Don't go there to do Absalom. Don't go there to seek your agenda. Go there to build with them. Then what else do we owe them? Love them. They are human beings. Love them with a pure heart. No complication, no agenda. What else do we owe them? Number seven, honor them. As First Thessalonians 5, 12, 13 says, do not wait for a leader to die before you honor. You know, there's a tribe in Africa. There are two tribes in Africa. One, you know, the Yorubas, they honor you when you're alive. They celebrate you, your bad day, your how everything you do. They'll come, they wear uniform, they honor you. There's another tribe, the Igbos. The Igbos will wait. You don't even know you affected them, but the day the man dies, come and see funeral oration. Come and see elegy. This man you see here, when I was down to nothing, hunger would have killed me, took me in. And for two years, he took care of me, paid my school fees, all that. Eh? And you didn't say it, you didn't reciprocate, it was alive. Brothers and sisters, that's a dead culture. It must be rejected. It must be rejected. And I say this to be one of the things the Lord taught me when I saw that thing in that uh, tribal route. I said, not on my watch. And by the grace of the Lord, 
we seek to honor those who are part of our experience by the grace of the Lord. Bless them as much as lies in you. It's so important. Bless them, whether it takes finances or whatever. If somebody is a leader in your life, bless them. And the Bible even says, the world, elders that rule well, they are worthy of double honor. When somebody is having great response and doing it well, don't just bless, do it generously. Do it extravagantly because that's the kingdom. When you do that, you obey the Lord. So what then do we do when leaders step on our toes? You know, what I'll share with you when you have time, look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 8, and Hebrews 13, verse 7 and verse 17. Every leader has a report of joy or of pain. Every whether spoken or unspoken. If you cause a leader grief and pain, that leader, if he's spiritual, will be praying, Lord, forgive, forgive, forgive. Don't hold it against her. And you continue. You are heaping coals of fire yourself. If he's unspiritual, Lord, deal with this person who is causing me such pain. That's unspiritual. That's dangerous prayer, people. But there's also a report of joy. Those who were the leader, remember, say, Father, thank you for this brother. Thank you for this sister. Lord, just open the door. Bless, exalt them because of the way you are touching the leader's life. That's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. It's true. And so be one who gets a report of joy. Report of joy. Men and brethren. Then what do we do when leaders step on our toes? Please give us a few extra minutes to round up this so that prayer can take on, please. What do we do when leaders step on our toes? Number one, understand that you cannot validly assume knowledge of why they took the course of action that you, you, felt, you felt hurt by. So don't assume. Number two, give them benefit of doubt. Put the best construction on what they said or did. It's very important. Put the best construction. If you put it properly, Holy Spirit may show you that it was not anything negative. Number three, if you are not able to bear it spiritually, proceed to two options. Prayerfully, approach the leader in the spirit of meekness and humility, explaining your heart. Avoid egotism, avoid haughtiness, avoid disrespect in so doing. Approach them. As Matthew 18, 15 says, you know what? Then number four, Avoid the spirit of hurt from latching into your spirit as well as the spirit of rejection. These satanic agents are on the prowl seeking whom to devour. Resist Satan. Don't let yourself be filled with hurt, 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 offense, offense. If you are doing it, it's yourself. It's, it's more or less like spiritual suicide to allow hurt and offense. To... Then, number five, understand that Elohim can use a leader to rebuke you, to save you. Or to correct you, to save you. You may not like it. To chastise you. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, 5 to 11, Despise thou not the chastening of the Lord, for whom the Lord loveth his chastening. Number 6, uh, sorry, number 5, Believe the word that whether the leader deliberately offended you or not, all things shall work together for your good. Now this is spiritual. If you can do this, if you cannot go to the leader, if the leader is not able to hear you and you have really made your case, you know, you can go with two people. He's a human being. He's a saint. The same principle. Go to them. And if he insists, it doesn't matter what he does, then you can look for whoever is the authority that he submits to and share with them what happened. And that is if you want to pursue it. Then what else do we do when leaders err? Or fall into sin because leaders are human beings. It is possible that they will err doctrinally or they can err by moral turpitude. What do you do? Number one, first and foremost, go to the Lord in intercession for their soul. And it is easier if you have already formed a godly habit of praying for leaders, not just more anointing, more anointing. Don't pray more anointing alone. Anyone who is leader, Pray the Lord will deliver them from wicked or reasonable men. Pray the Lord will deliver them from seduction of agents of Satan, you know, the opposite gender. Pray for many things about leader. So if a leader does something that is egregious as you see it, pray first and foremost. Second, avoid the temptation of sitting in judgment over them by yourself. That's why you take it to the Lord because he said in the book of Romans 14, 
he is able to deal with his sister. Romans 14, verse 4 and verse 7 to 13. Number three, if the Holy Spirit leads you, we can lovingly but gently confront them in a way that is not designed to shame them. Otherwise, you can refer the matter to authorities, they submit you. That's why we say to every minister, you should be part of a network so that if anything goes wrong, people will know where to go to to lay their complaint. It is so important. All these independent ministers who are managing and damaging directors of their religious enterprises, they, don't, they are not part of a minister's network. They are not connected. Nobody can correct them. They are danger to the soul of those they lead. Then number five, never celebrate the fall of your leader or participate in any glorification of his or her fall. If it's moral turpitude, don't celebrate it. The Bible says don't celebrate people when they are down. Don't do that. Don't begin to, yeah, I said it. Yeah, I said it. No. Be in prayer. Ask the Lord to restore that one. And then, men and brethren, the final one is that if you are persuaded, this is very important, number five or six, if you are persuaded a leader has missed it morally, spiritually, pray and ask the Lord. The Lord will lead you. And you can leave a place without drama. Don't try to pull down the house as if you are now God himself to deal with the person. God knows how best to deal with that person. Move if you cannot stay with a leader for any reason under the sun. And then, brothers and sisters, let's answer this final question and we're done. What is the sort of authority in Romans chapter 13, verse 4 and 5? The sort of authority is... The authority every true leader has in the Lord to do these things. Number one, render a report to Elohim concerning a brother or sister. As we saw in Hebrews chapter 13, verse uh, 12, and Romans 13, 2. Render a negative report concerning somebody's life or lifestyle. Two, pronounce the degree of discipline necessary to deal with with that negative behavior. There's a, there are degrees of discipline. It can be, okay, don't minister for three months. It can be, don't minister for six months. It can be, okay, you're not going to do any pastoral function. Don't call anybody. Don't visit anybody. Just do whatever you do. It has to be in public. Let's say somebody is used to giving people personal prophecy. It, it, it will just tell you, this is what God says. This what, and he doesn't want people to hear. That's negative. So it may be that the uh, display you impose is, please don't give anybody personal prophecy. Everything you do, do it openly so that others can hear and judge it. Okay. Number three, it's also the ability to hand over a recalcitrant sinner, one who remains in sin, to Satan to deal with the flesh so that the spirit is saved. As in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 to 5, which Paul judged a matter, a matter in Corinth. He was not there. He said, hand over that person to Satan. Every true authority carries that capacity, especially those who are in the fivefold and who have responsibility over flock. They have the capacity to hand over people to Satan. It's not something to be excised lightly or for just mere simple uh, issues that come up. No, it is as an act of discipline. Then, number four, it's also the capacity to render a good report to Elohim, like we said before about somebody who is getting it right and asking the Lord to bless that person. A sort of authority is also, number six, a word of blessing to those who do well and to decree the prosperity and the way open for them. And so, brothers and sisters, we come to the end of course 112, the fivefold, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Now, we want you to go and read through these things and make sure you get it in. And if you have been a student, if you are in a master class, the director of studies will give you a, 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 a capacity to do a feedback, write a full-fledged feedback on this course. They do the course impact assessment to determine whether you understood the course or not, and then we'll move over to another course on Monday. Now listen, if you are here blogging along with us, you can also do the feedback by go to prayerfully write down on your notes or piece of paper, all the Lord has taught you in this course, true and true. And then you can copy it and paste, you know, here on the thread. And by the grace of the Lord, it will come right in there, feedback, apart from your normal blogging for today. And brothers and sisters, with that, we come to the end. I want to say with some good news. By the grace of the Lord, 
in a matter of days, perhaps next week, we'll go live with on Facebook the Five Fold Academy. The Five Fold Academy. We have thought that okay, some people were not part of this trading, and yet they need the revelation of what the Lord has brought forth in this course. And because of that revelation, if they are looking for it all over the place, it's difficult. Or some people are not able to go to YouTube, they're just on Facebook as we have created an academy where all the lessons and all the uh, videos are there together. So it's called Facebook, I mean, the Fivefold Academy for Apostles, Prophets, Evangelists, Pastors, and Teachers. So it's going to go live soon. And so you yourself, if you miss some lessons, you can go there. And if you really want to do it as a course, you'd go there and take time and go through it. Or if you know anyone in the fivefold or call to the fivefold, I was speaking with one yesterday who is in New Jersey, call to the fivefold, and I call it to please embrace it. You know somebody called to be an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, pastor, a teacher, or one who is already in it, you can tell them, go to Facebook, just put in your search bar, the Fivefold Academy. Brothers and sisters, it's going to be an innovation. Everything about the Fivefold we have taught you will be in one place. Lesson, video, lesson, video, lesson, video, and so that you can take your time. And I want to say to you, if you miss some things in the process, you can, even though you studied with us all this one month, you can also go in there by the grace of the Lord and do it more deliberately at your own pace. You want to do one a day, you want to do one in two days, you want to do one, one lesson in three days, that's your business. You want to do one in a week or during the weekend, you can take it at your own pace and do it and do the assignment. And after that, you do the cost impact assessment, we're going to certify you for that. So even though you are doing the general course, but if you finish this one, we'll certify you as one who can teach people the fivefold. And if you have done it here also with us, we will also confirm you at the end of the whole program. Thank you so much. And we're going to uh, uh, pray and make some announcements. Father, we thank you. Pray that your word has gone forth. Lord, strengthen your people and cause them to walk in the light of truth. Let this reformation take place worldwide. Lay hold of these ones and use them to push this truth further according to their spheres of influence, to the whole continents of the world, so that, Lord, before the Antichrist manifests, before the rapture, Lord, the church shall be perfected to be that bride that is ready for the return of the King. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So please bear with us for the extra time we took. Today's bad days are Sakile, Sibia, uh, Morris in Chukwu, Chido Zin, Sidney Obu, Denise Ono and Apostle Victoria Felder, you know, by the grace of the Lord, we thank the Lord for them and we're going to pray for them. Uh, elect, thank you so much for being a cameraman. Thank you.